talking about chains, but where there's chains, there's bondage. When the chains are broken, there is freedom. Do we understand freedom in Christ this morning? Hallelujah. Let's worship him a little bit. Let's lift him up. Hallelujah. God, we give you glory in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I love what I feel in the house of God today. You can tell there's just something about the presence of God. There's just something about being able to come into the presence of the Almighty. And we can come in and we can bring what burdens us. We can come in and we can bring with us those things that make us flawed. Those things that make us imperfect. We can bring those chains. But we don't have to leave with those same things. Just like the song said that we were just singing. Those chains that we had identified with are broken. You've stolen my heart. Everything that I am is now yours. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to stand before you today. I also want to give honor where honor is due to Pastor Romer for allowing me the opportunity. It's something that I, I, I don't ever want to take lightly. But I love preaching. It's something that I've always loved to do ever since, you know, I felt that God was kind of pushing me in this direction. Um, but I will say that I, I do feel like, especially with the way that things have gone this service, that I, I feel like that I do have a word from the Lord for you today. So it is with, it is with great, uh, a great burden that I stand behind this platform today. Amen. I want to uh, jump right in. So if you have your Bibles, please turn. Uh, the first scripture we'll be taking will be um, from uh, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. Amen. Acts 16 and 16. And when you have it, say amen. 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 Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 16. Very familiar passage of scripture. It says this, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her, her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And this is the verse I want us to focus on. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Amen. If you will turn your attention to Psalms chapter 71 starting at verse 7. Psalm 71 starting at verse 7. It says this, I am as a wonder unto many, but thou art my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemies speak against me. And they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God hath forsaken him. Persecute him and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my heart. But I will hope continually and yet and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. 
verse 16. Let's focus on that. It says this, I will go in the strength of the Lord. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Even of thine only. If you will allow me just a couple of minutes this morning, I would like to preach to you over this topic. The stocks, the bands, and the prison doors. Amen. Will you help me pray this morning? God, I pray that your will would be done in the remainder of this service. And Lord, above all else, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word, God. And that I pray that you would begin to mold us and shape us the way that you've seen fit, Lord. And that we would be servants of your kingdom. And God, I pray that when we leave this place, that we would leave changed and challenged in your name. And that we would be servants of your kingdom above all else. And we give you glory and we give you praise, Jesus. And we lift you up your name. Come on, can we clap our hands to him today? God, we give you praise and we give you glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. You're going to preach with me this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Now in our text, we read of an account concerning Paul and some of his companions. It's a familiar story and one that we can, uh, many of us could recite, could recite by memory. And in fact, it's one of the most popular stories in the New Testing and the New Testament concerning the ongoings of the early church. Nonetheless, we find Paul and his partner Silas uh, in a certain province of Rome called Macedonia, in the capital city of Philippi. Their journeys, being led by the Holy Ghost continually, had brought them to this cultural hub for the sake of preaching and teaching the gospel. For the sake of the church being the church and simply doing what the church does. That's why they were brought to this city, led by the Holy Spirit. Such was Paul's custom. That's just what Paul did the majority of his life. He would enter a city or an area and he would begin to preach and he would begin to teach the power and the cause of Christ. And from there he would build a body of believers or as we would say he would plant a church. And then he would move on to the next city that God would lead him in to serve. And Paul would do this over and over again in his lifetime. Many times in his ministry. From city to city, people would testify of the power of God that touched them and changed them when the Apostle Paul came through town. And with little to no protection from any organization, from any type of society, and all the political powers of his day wishing to shut him down, there, there being no law made to protect him. Paul would preach and Paul would teach and he would disciple and he would train young men and women to do the exact same thing. And he would do all of this with hell breathing down his back every step of the way. You see, the will of God will always come with opposition. The will of God will always come with a certain grind, if you will. You see, hell will always be waiting to hinder the plans and the purposes of heaven. If there's anything that the life of the apostles has taught us today, it's that hell has every intention on fighting back. It's that hell has every intention on trying to take the reins. But just because hell fights you doesn't mean that hell beats you. Just because hell begins to cause friction doesn't mean that you've stopped. Just because Satan hinders God's plan for you does not mean that he stops God's plan for your life. Listen, adversity in your life does not mean failure. Adversity does not equate to failure. Hardship in your walk is not an indication that you're moving in the wrong direction. But rather it means that you've managed to capture the enemy's attention. And you've provided every reason to be thought of as a threat to the adversary. It is not a sign of your defeat. It is not a sign of your downfall. But it is a signification of your future victory. That is friction. Let hell do what it wants. Let the gates of hell slam in your face. It doesn't matter because you have a purpose and you have a calling and you are God ordained and you will keep going and you will keep fighting and you will emerge victorious because that is the plan of God. So nobody understood persecution quite like Paul did. Nobody got it like Paul did. See, he had the right idea. He had a correct understanding of what it meant to be a servant of the kingdom. Make no mistake, saint of God, Paul had a target on his back as well. Just like you and I. Any lesser man in Paul's shoes would have quit in hopes of an easier life. 
in hopes of a better route with less pain and less friction, but not Paul. Certainly not Paul. No, because Paul knew firsthand the changing power of the Almighty. You see, Paul had an experience. Paul had a testimony of a God who put him on his back in the dirt on the road to Damascus and spoke to him personally after stopping him dead in his tracks and bringing him to his knees. And it was in that moment, lying in the dirt, talking to a voice that he had sworn his entire youth, that he had dedicated himself to destroying. It was in that moment that the power of Christ changed a murderer into a minister and turned an arrogant and stiff-necked thug on a troubling path into an avid and absolutely powerful servant of the kingdom with a bright future. He changed the entire dynamic of this man's life. You see, Saul, a young man who was misdirected due to his culture and due to the teachings of his mentors, who had shed the blood of innocent men and women and arranging the assassination and executions of Christians left and right. That same young hardened man would go on to become Paul, a man of compassion, a man of faith, a leader in the church and a devout and powerful preacher. That same man who was going down a path of destruction would again change his path to build people up and to start a future for others and would begin to preach the cause of Christ. And I venture to say, ladies and gentlemen, concerning the testimony he experienced firsthand on the road to Damascus that Paul was determined deep down to his core at the very at the very core of his being at the very heart of who he was he was determined to spread this life-changing message regardless of whatever opposition came his way see it didn't matter what it was that came up against him it didn't matter what it was that he had to face Nothing was going to stop Paul from pursuing the things of God in his life and having a sense of fulfillment. There wasn't anything that was going to stop Paul from preaching. There was nothing that was going to stop Paul from being a teacher and from being a mentor. Nothing was going to stop him from being a world changer. And this was a man with such a dark and dreary past. You talk about the difference of daylight and dark. That's the difference between Saul and Paul. A man that was once going down a path of murder and destruction. God steps in and changes the whole scenario. And all of a sudden you see a man, not somebody with a sword in his hand, not somebody giving orders to kill, but a man that's saying you can have life and life more abundantly. That is Paul. Let me just pause right here because I feel like we really need to address this. Let's just take a second out. I think maybe we can take a lesson from Paul here. Because where the blood of Christ is applied, the past becomes a non-factor. Where the blood of Christ is there, the past becomes something completely irrelevant. That's the beauty of saving grace. It's almost as though it's not there anymore. You see, it doesn't matter where it is that you come from. It doesn't matter how inadequate that you feel. God doesn't care about your pedigree. He doesn't care about who your dad is. God doesn't care about your prior reputation everything is under the blood your past is under the blood your sin is under the blood the chaos that you caused the wreckage that you left behind you that's all been wiped away washed in the waters of baptism in Jesus name make no mistake ladies and gentlemen you are a new creature I want you to get this you are a new creature with a new name and with a new destiny you are not Saul you are Paul you are a new You are a new creature in the kingdom of God. And you have a new God-given purpose that lies before you. And there is nothing. There is no circumstance. There is no person. There is no position. There is no devil in hell that can stop you. Come on, do you believe that today? If our God is for us, then who could stand against us? What could stand against your calling? What could stand against your dream? What could stand against your purpose? I tell you, seize the power of Christ. You are no longer tied up in your power but you have a bright and shining future you know we get so caught up in what was that we forget about what is and we forget about what's to come sometimes we get so caught up in the past because that's where we're comfortable because we already know what happened back there but let me tell you something whatever happened back there is nothing compared to what's happening up there is nothing compared to what's happening in your future But you can't keep living in the past. What would have Paul been if he had still ascribed to the ideas of Saul? Who 
would have Paul been if he would have still had that hatred and he would have still had that stiff neckedness about him and he was still ascribing to the ideas of murder and he was still one of those people if there was no change in the life of Saul, there would have never been a Paul. But there must be a kind of seizing of the moment for Pauls all over the world to say, I am no longer Saul. I don't believe the ideas of Saul anymore. Whatever it is that I did in my past, that's not who I am anymore. Oh, yes. Opposition's going to come. Opposition will come. Inevitably, the life that we live seems to put a target on our backs. In Paul's case, regardless of how successful that he was, when he got to any given location, wherever it was that he went to minister, there was almost always an intense opposition from the adversary against him by the time he left. It wasn't an easy road, and it certainly isn't something that just fell in his lap. It's something that he had to work for. And it wasn't because he was doing something wrong. It wasn't because that he was doing something that wasn't right. It, was because, it wasn't because that he was failing. That certainly wasn't the case. The effects that Paul had had in his ministry, it's made ripple effects all throughout the generations. The man that wrote the majority of the New Testament where we, we find many of the foundations of our beliefs. But when you start to rock the boat a little bit, when you start to make things a little bit uncomfortable, we start to make a couple waves and go head to head with the worldly system of our adversary and you start to oppose the spirit of our age and everything that's dark, sinful, and wrong with society in the hearts of man. Don't expect the enemy to start pulling punches, ladies and gentlemen. The gloves are off. Don't expect to stand up in opposition of the world and not have friction coming back against you. Don't expect to fight hell and hell not to fight back. Paul understood this because he lived it. This isn't just something that Paul experimented with. This isn't stories that Paul had heard. This is Paul's life. And he speaks very clearly of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 29, he says this. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep, I was lost at sea, adrift for a day and a half. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And weariness and, and painfulness and watchings often and hunger and thirst and fastings often and cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the churches. And he asks this question, he says, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? See, the text we read from the book of Acts was simply one of those many instances that Paul had spoke about. However, it's interesting to note that the detail that was given to this specific story. There was a reason behind it. See, the rulers of the city called Philippi, they intended to deal quite harshly with Paul and Silas. They intended to make sure that they got their point across and use them as an example. So they had believed every word that was spoken about them. And it wasn't enough to beat them. No, it wasn't enough to make them bleed a little bit. But they cast them into an area of the prison where prisoners were never expected to leave. Ultimately, they were on trial for their life. And here they were, sitting in the prison in a dark place simply because they were doing the work of the Lord. Here they sat in the prison because they were preaching the gospel, helping people and pointing them to Christ. That's why they were in prison. The only reason, the only reason they were even here is because Paul had a God-given dream that came to him at night of a man from Macedonia begging him to come and help. It's the only reason why they were there. And here they sit. There they are in chains in the inner prison in pitch blackness. Their hands and their feet bound by chains, stocks, and bands. Locked tight behind prison doors from which they may never escape. All for the sake of doing something right. 
And how often do we, you and I, the people of God, find ourselves in a strangely similar situation? Innocent by all rights, following our God-given dream, and all of a sudden, our whole world comes to a screeching halt. And here we are, bound up in chains, fastened in the stocks and the bands, and placed behind the prison doors of our circumstance where the adversary intends for us to stay until our spirit dies out. Until we lose all hope, until we lose all fight. And there in that prison, we sat in that darkness, the darkest time of our life with no excuse, no answers. But I'm here to let somebody in this place know beyond the shadow of a doubt that your story does not have to end behind prison bars. Your story doesn't have to end in the chains. Your circumstance and your bondage, they don't have to lock you in forever. The prison door may be shut and fast and tight, but let me remind you of a God who is a way maker. Let me bring back to your remembrance of a God who is a liberator. The God of your personal testimony. The God who saved you. The God who changed you. The God who gave you a new purpose. Who gave you a new name. That's the God that I'm talking about. And I tell you with a surety and truth behind this pulpit this morning, APC, that if he can change your heart, if he can change your path, if he can change your destiny, then what are the stocks, the bands, and the prison doors to God? What is the prison compared to the power of the Almighty? Come on, do you believe in a God that can do the miraculous today? Do you believe in a God who has saved you once and can bring you out again? that can deliver you and break your chains? Do you believe in a God that will set you free? Do you believe in a God of victory? If we do, if we say that we believe that, if we say amen to that, then why don't we start praising in our prison cell? Why don't we start worshiping in our chains like Paul and like Silas? Begin to worship in your darkest hour because your deliverance is on its way. You're not going to be a captive forever. You're not going to be in the chains forever, but your deliverance is well on its way. Worship if you believe that. Sometimes we get so focused, and I know I talked about it a second ago, but I feel like I need to hit it again. Sometimes we get so focused on where we are that we forget about why we're there. Yeah, I hate to break it to you, but even your prison cell has a purpose. Even your prison cell, the place that you hate, the place that you want to escape, even it has a purpose. You didn't wind up there by accident. And God certainly hasn't left you there, but on the contrary, this is just another vital step in the plan. This is just another part of the grand scheme. You see, it's so easy to lose our focus on God when we're tied up in things like opposition and we're tied up in depression and in addiction and in persecution and unfair circumstances. We suddenly become more focused on finding answers We suddenly become more focused on the circumstance and the chains that we forget about seeking the face of God. We become so focused on finding answers that seeking the face of God is the furthest thing from our mind. Listen, if a few fashioned pieces of metal is all it takes to pull you away from a mindset of worship, then the problem lies much deeper than your chains, ladies and gentlemen. Saints of God, let me say that the problem is not in the chains. The problem is in your outlook. The problem isn't in your bondage. The problem is in your sight and how you see where you are. You see, God doesn't change just because your surroundings change. Just because you feel like you have lost your liberty does not mean you have lost out with God. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Correct me if I'm wrong, but are we not people of the name? So regardless of where you are, regardless of what prison you set in, or whatever chains bind you around the wrist, regardless of whatever prison door you set behind, worship like you're free. Worship like you're liberated. Because God is greater than your bondage. God is greater than your chains. When you wake up in the morning, worship Him. When you stand on the mountaintop, worship Him. When you preach about Him, worship Him. When you teach about Him, worship Him. When you sing about Him, worship Him. In bondage. 
in prison, in chains. You see, that doesn't seem to settle well with us. Something in our flesh rises up in resistance to that concept because we want to focus on the issue at hand. And by doing so, all of a sudden, those chains, those stocks, the bands, and the prison doors become our idols because it's all that we can think about. And in that twisted way, we begin to worship what binds us instead of what liberates us. We begin to make that bondage our God. The things that set us free, we no longer concern ourselves with that because we're too occupied with the chains around our wrist. When you wake up in the morning, it's all you can think about. When you're on the mountaintop, all that is is just a memory. What liberates you is now part of the past, or so it seems. And in doing so, we begin to worship those chains. We begin to worship what it is that holds us back. But let me make something clear. There is no freedom like that. There is absolutely no freedom like that. There is no liberation or peace in living like that. Living in that fashion will keep you locked up and will keep you chained up with nowhere to go. But instead, instead of focusing on the chains, instead of focusing on the stocks, the bands, and the prison doors, we must be like Paul and Silas and we must worship. We must worship. There is victory in your worship to God because once you lift him up, listen to me now, once you lift him up in your chains, you have recognized that God is greater than your confinement. <laughs> Once you lift him up in your bondage, you have said, God, it doesn't matter where I am. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to worship you. It doesn't matter what I face. It doesn't matter what I go through, what trial I have to walk through. I'm going to worship you anyway. I hope I don't go over anybody's head here, but I want to I wanna interject something. See, God doesn't respond so much to fair-weather Christians who can only find a reason to worship on the mountain or can only find a reason to worship in the sunshine and the rainbows of life, but God responds to a raw type of worship that isn't based on where you are, but is based on who he is. God responds to a type of worship that isn't born out of feeling good, but is born out of obligation and to love of who he is and who he is to you and the life that he's given you. It's the kind of liberating worship like Paul and Silas. We didn't, they didn't need a reason when they were in the prison cell, when they began to worship. And that's the kind of resolve that we need for us to say, when I'm on the mountain, I'm going to worship. When I preach, I'm going to worship. And when I teach, I'm going to worship. When I sing, I'm going to worship. And when I'm in bondage, I'm going to worship. When I'm in prison, I'm going to worship. When I'm in chains, I'm going to worship. When I'm confused and when I'm hurt, when nothing makes sense and I can't figure this out, I'm going to worship. Why? Because greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. These chains may hinder me, but they won't stop me. My God is stronger than the chains. He is greater than the stocks, the bands, and the prison doors of my life. And I will be free. You can focus on the chains if you want. But there's no liberty there. You can focus on your bondage if you so please. But you will always be focusing on your bondage. And you will never be liberated until you begin to focus and you begin to worship the liberator. Your worship will give you victory. But only if it's a kind of worship that's going to worship wherever you are. See, worship isn't about something you do. Worship is a lifestyle. And regardless of where you are in your life, regardless if you're having the best time of all of your years, regardless if you're on the mountaintop, or regardless if you're in the prison cell, are you consistent with your worship? Are you consistent in your love for God? Because until we reach a point that says, I don't care if I'm liberated. I don't care if I'm bound up. I don't care if I'm stuck behind prison bars. 
Worship is what I do. Worship is who I am. So you never see Paul and Silas. Not once, not once do they ever acknowledge where they are. They just worship. The music would come. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, verse 30, of the chapter that we had read previously. If we go on a little bit further of what we had read. He says this. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. I'm not going to fret over the chains. I'm not going to fret over the bondage. But I will find glory in what binds me. Because what binds me is nothing more than a testimony of the power of God. Maybe not now. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not even next month. But it's nothing more than an opportunity for God to show himself as a liberator. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. If we could all stand. And I want to finish with this thought. Freedom is never the extent of our liberty from bondage. Freedom is never the extent of our liberty from bondage. Just as I had said before, even in our prison cell, even the place that we hate, in the prison cell, there's a purpose. See, many times our greatest trials are our greatest testimony. In the midst of the chaos, Paul and Silas saved a man from suicide and was able to witness to him and his family. All because God led them to the right place at the right time. You see, just because you're not comfortable where you are, just because you don't understand where you are does not mean that you're in the wrong place. Maybe God has set you at the right place at the right time for a given purpose. But you see, that would have never been accomplished if they had focused on their chains. The purpose of their prison cell would have never been accomplished if they had focused on the stocks, the bands, and the prison doors. There would have never been a witness to the jailer and his family. You see, in the end, those chains that bind you, the stocks, the bands, and the prison doors will be designated to you as a trophy. A memento of victory for you and a testimony to others. But we must first be free. And to do that, we must learn that God is indeed greater than our chains, that he is greater than our bondage. And we must learn to worship in spite of the chains. We must learn to worship in spite of our imprisonment, in spite of where we are. And there is no better place to start than right here and right now. I want to open these altars up to you today. And I plead that you would come. The liberty that waits for you, the breaking apart of your chains it goes so much deeper than freedom but perhaps it's part of your purpose amen why don't you come amen these altars are open and I pray that you would come and that you would lay